We're going to be focusing on authenticity today. And hopefully, if you saw the updates in the email, if you kind of were able to follow a little bit of our direction, then you understand that through these next few weeks, we're going to be doing a series called Messy, knowing that life isn't always that perfectly straight path, but instead there's always twists, there's always turns, and there's always the unexpected moments. And as we go through that series, one of the resources that I would strongly suggest uh, for your small group, for your family, for you yourself, is the book Messy Spirituality by Mike Iaconelli. And as we go through those chapters a little bit, there's certain scriptures that just continue to be highlighted and continue to be illuminated. And in that second chapter, the scripture that I want to focus on today is from the book of 1 Timothy. And 1 Timothy is certainly an interesting book, not only because it is Paul writing, but is, it's interesting because Paul takes a little bit of a different angle in this book. And the reason I say that, the reason that that becomes interesting for us is because most of the other letters that Paul writes in the New Testament are all focusing on talking to a complete church. Whether it's Galatians or Ephesians, Philippians, he's writing to the entire church and he's saying these words that the whole church needs to hear and needs to know. But in 1 Timothy, we get a little bit of a different angle because he's not writing to a group of people anymore. Instead, he's writing to one individual. He's writing to Timothy. He's writing to this person who means a lot to him. And the reason I say that is because this sort of sets up the understanding of a mentor-mentee relationship. And I want you to understand and I want you to see that during this relationship, Paul goes through the ups and the downs with Timothy. In fact, if you read through this scripture and you check your notes on the NIV study Bible, it will say that there is a history between Timothy and Paul that travels around many different locations and travels through many different different situations. Paul and Timothy had been on journeys together, planting churches. They had been on journeys together, being persecuted for their faith. And the reason I'm setting that up so much is because I want you to know that Paul and Timothy have a very special relationship. Timothy means a lot to Paul as a mentor, mentee, even as a father, as a son. If you read the first, very first ver verse of this book of 1 Timothy, he calls him a son in Jesus Christ. And so I want you to know how much Paul has of a care for Timothy and how much this means to him. And I also want you to know that as we talk about messiness, as we talk about this description of a not always straight, perfect path, we're going to get into the understanding that Paul is authentic with Timothy. He is real with Timothy, and he's able to tell him some, some certain things that he might not have shared to the entire church. And what that sets up for us is the understanding that as we are called to be authentic, as we are called to be real with each other, with Jesus Christ, and with ourselves, there's an understanding that Paul and Timothy are giving us an example of what it means to be authentic and what it looks like to be real with each other. With all of that being said, I want to go through 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, especially verses 15 through 17. But of course, we cannot do this, we will not do this, without the power of the Holy Spirit to translate my broken words, my broken thoughts, and to give us ears to hear, and to give us fertile soil in our hearts to be used by Jesus Christ. So join me in a time of prayer. Let's pray. God, your scripture is living and active. Your scripture is real. It's not a dead book. It's not something that happened so many years ago. It's not something that just is noise. Your scripture gives us the words of life. Your scripture speaks to us in a way that nothing else can. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, this is your love letter to us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, this is you speaking to us this morning. And so please, oh please, 
Let my words be translated, God. Please, oh, please let our hearts be ready to receive what it is that you are about to give us. This is a living and active word. This is an effectual word. A word that can and will do something. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, there is no way that we can just walk out of here unchanged. There is no way that we can just simply consider this just the same old thing. Your scripture will speak to us today. We come expecting that. And in expectation, we believe that you will call us to start a new life. We believe that you will call us to stop something that we have been doing. We believe that you will give us an idea, give us a thought, give us a comfort, give us a reminder. You will do something today, God. I believe it. And so work as only you can. May the words in my mouth, the meditations in my heart be pleasing in your sight. For you are my rock and you are my redeemer. In your holy name we pray. Amen. In the second chapter of that book, uh, Messy Spirituality, we actually uh, have a quote from Mike Iaconelli that talks about what it means to have a personal relationship. And he says this, pretending is the grease of modern relationships. Pretending perpetuates the illusion of relationships by connecting us on the basis of who we aren't. Being real is a synonym for messy spirituality because when we are real, our messiness is there for everyone to see. And as I read through that quote, I couldn't help but think of Paul's realness as he writes to Timothy. Paul's realness as he writes to us so many years later. Understanding that Paul is being authentic in what he has gone through and in what he is going through. And hopefully that sets the stage for us to then question what does it mean to be authentic with ourselves? What does it mean to be real with each other? What does it mean to be real with God? And to come out on the other end knowing that he still is in love with us. From 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 15 through 17, we're going to walk through these words and I'm going to push pause a couple times and just say a couple of comments, a couple of thoughts that I believe God has laid on my heart. In verse 15 we have this, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Stop for just a second and I want to remind you of what it is that we talked about last week. One of the most fun things that I uh, have done when I do sermons is to ask people, to ask the crowd, to ask the congregation, hey, what did we talk about last week? And most often, there's, o there's only one or two people who will raise their hands and say, this is what it was, this is what we talked about. But I want to challenge you and ask you, what was the passage last week? What did we talk about? And what was the focus for our beginning of the series, beginning our series called Messy. Anybody remember what the passage was? It was Matthew, and what was the kind of description? What was going on? Yeah, so the tax collector sitting at the booth, and you remember Levi was the one who had done all of these movements towards being a tax collector, and had kind of lost the, the love of society around him, and he was under this uh, sort of Roman government idea, and Jesus comes up to Levi, and he tells him to follow him, and he does. And then Jesus goes on to describe the fact that I didn't come to save the righteous. Instead, I came to call the sinners. After he was being questioned, after he was being told that these aren't the kind of people you want to hang out with, he told them that he was there for the sinners. And we have a description, we have a fulfillment of that. Uh, the other uh, story, the other side of it is from Luke. And if you remember just this one line in Luke chapter 5 verse 32, I have not come to call the righteous, but instead I have come to call the sinners to repentance. And my hope is that you understood last week, and apparently i got to re-say it a few times because only one person remembers it, but the idea being that Jesus Christ came for those who were imperfect. He didn't come for those who have it all together. He didn't come for those who have it all figured out. He came for sinners of which we are. 
He came for the unrighteous to make them whole, to make them clean, and to make them new. In fact, that's a great lead-in. Remember, we're going to celebrate communion later. We're going to celebrate communion after this. And one of the words that I'll say is the fact that you don't have to have it all figured out to come to this table. You simply need to know that you stand in need of a Savior. And that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. And so Paul writes these words back to uh, Timothy, if we jump back to verse 15, a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We rest on that. We believe in that. It was one of the main questions that we asked Dylan, are you a sinner? And do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior? It's where we rest on in our Christian faith. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. The rest of that verse says this. Uh, this is Paul's word. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the worst. Now, just a few verses before that, Paul actually went into the description of his testimony. He went into the, the description of his resume of his life, and he began to remind Timothy and remind us that he was one who actually persecuted the church. He was one who actually went around to those who believe in Jesus Christ, and he put them to death. He put them to death for confessing that they believe in Jesus Christ. And so when Paul says, of which I am the worst, I want you to understand and I want you to hear that this is not a false humility. This is not him saying, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm probably the worst. I'm probably the one that really shouldn't be followed. My old life, the examples, all that kind of stuff. Don't do that. No, no, he is being absolutely sincere. He is being absolutely certain and he is being true to what he is telling Timothy. I believe that I didn't deserve this grace, he says. I believe that all of that other junk of all of those things that I did make me undeserving because I am a sinner. Because I saw the path that God wanted me to go on and I went the other way. He is being absolutely true with Timothy and he is telling him that I have sinned and I'm opening myself up to you and telling you that and telling God that. One of the uh, quotes that I saw on Twitter this week uh, was from a Canadian pastor and author uh, named uh, Bruxy Cavey. And he actually went this, uh, if you could put that up for me, he actually gave us this tweet and uh, uh, saw it retweeted several times. Humility is not trying to think worse of yourself. No, it's not inviting others to think worse of us. Instead, humility is our willingness to be known for who we truly are. Humility is being known for who we truly are. And then it's our commitment to value others for who they are. Paul is giving us an example of this. He's giving us not a false humility. He's giving us a true humility. Willing to be known by Timothy. As the worst of the worst sinners. Willing to be known by those who read this letter. That he is one who has persecuted. He is one who has done the things that God didn't want him to do. He is one who went the opposite direction of following God. He's willing to put that on paper. He's willing to say that to Timothy. He's willing to own up to the sinner that he is. And I believe that's where our authenticity starts. Am I willing to own up to it? Am I willing to say, yeah, that's me. I'm a sinner. Am I willing to say, that's me, that's the things that I have done. That wasn't someone else, that wasn't, I'm not going to blame somebody else and say, well, they made me do it. No, that was me. I did that, and I own it, and I'm real with it. Jump back to Luke chapter 15, because there's an incredible progression that Paul does here. Not only is he owning it for himself, not only is he being real and saying, this is, this is what I believe I did. Not only is he giving that authenticity to Timothy, but most importantly, he's giving that authenticity to God. 
He's standing in front of God and saying, I'm not going to try to fake it. I'm not going to try to act my way into this Christian faith. I am simply going to stand here as who I am, God. And I'm going to ask that you accept me. And the reality is, is that he does. In verse 16, for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and those who would receive eternal life. As an example, Paul was given mercy. As an example, Paul was given grace. As I thought about this, about how to describe this, as I thought about how to show this, an example of Wading through the falseness came to my mind. And so I asked Sarah to come and join me. Uh, and I asked her to put on a nice safety shirt for me. And Sarah, she could have gone with mom to another church, but she wanted to come with dad so that she could be a part of the sermon. And Sarah is going to be my core belief. I want you to hold on to that about this is, this is who I am. We're going we're gonna to use this as an example that all of this is Gary. All of this is inside my being, right? All of this, let's say these walls are my soul, if you will. And we're going to try to understand a little bit about how we get to that core. So I asked Sarah to go over there. And what I want you to do you guys want to kind of stand up? Just, just you, your front row. Yep, you guys stand up for me. They're like, yeah, I guess so, all right. And move this way. Kind of block me from getting to Sarah a little bit. Here's what I'm trying to get at. If this is all Gary, if this is all like wading through the things that are Gary, so to speak, then what you're going to find is all kinds of descriptions of me. You're going to find all kinds of uh, uh, analogies that I'm going to give you as far as who I am. And so I'll kind of stand in a little bit of a line. Tristan, you go in the back there and kind of block me. You're going to come up and you're going to say, hey, Gary, how are you? And, and in fact, let's go this way. You don't even know me. And so you're going to come up and you're going to say, hey, who are you? And I'm going to say, you're going to say this. Hi, I'm Gary and I'm a pastor. Okay, so hi, how are you? Okay, so Gary is a pastor. So I know that Gary is a pastor. And understand that in, kinds of, in all of these things, especially the pastor world, maybe if for you it's a, a description of what you do. Maybe it's a description of what you have done and all this kind of stuff. This is a way to define me. This is a way to define who Gary is. Maybe you can put that in your language and you can say, well, I'm a plumber, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, whatever it is. That thing you believe defines you. But I'm going to play a little bit of a, a, a Jesus role here. And I'm going to try to say something and try to act something. I'm going to be Jesus in this scenario. And I'm going to try to walk through this. But you're going to kind of block me. Because my person, Gary, doesn't want to go any deeper. I don't want to be real. I don't want to be authentic. I want you to only know me on the surface. Maybe I just want you to know that I'm a pastor and that's it. Maybe you just want people to know that you're a mom, you're a dad, and that's it. Maybe you just want people to know what it is that you do, and that's it. But what Jesus wants to do is say, no, no, no. I know you're a pastor, that's great, but I want to go deeper, man. I want to know you. I want to know the real you, because the real you is over there. The real you is over there. Those things that you, have, that you hide from yourself, those things that you hide from other people, that junk that you say isn't worthy of being in church, that junk that you say isn't worthy of being known, it's back there. It's back there. And me, Jesus, I want to get to that. I want to get to that. So now you're going to say, uh, I grew up in Rock Rapids. So hi, uh, who are you? I'm Gary. And what do I know about you? I grew up in Rock Rapids. Okay, that's great, but I want to get to the real you. It's not, about, it's not about you being a pastor. It's not about you growing up in Rock Rapids. I want to know the real you. I want to know the real you. This is Jesus trying to get to the real you because the real you is authentic. The real you is back there. And I'm going to move this away. And I'm going to say, come on, now let me there. I want to know the real you. And you're going to say, I live in Orange City. Hi, I'm, 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 who are you? I'm Gary, and I live in Orange City. Okay, that's fine. But let me through. Let me through. I want to know the real you. So imagine what's happening here. You're sitting, and you're introducing yourself to Jesus Christ. And just like we do in so many situations, hey, I'm Gary. Oh, how's it going, Gary? Oh, everything's fine. I'm good. 
everything's fine, and we can say those words, and we can give that surface answer. But I tell you this morning, just as Paul went deeper with Timothy, Jesus wants to go deeper with Jesus wants to not know this first answer, this second answer. Man, I want to know deeper. I want to know really about you. So let me through. I know that, yeah, that's great. You're from Orton City. And that's a whole nother scenario. But you're, you're, I'm going to go through. I'm going to go deeper. Okay, now this is the tough one. Because he told me he was in the, in the offensive line in high school. So whew, here we go. All right, so you're going to tell me, uh, um, you're going to tell me, uh, I value my kids a lot, okay? So I value my kids, and that's me being authentic. I value my kids a lot. And so it, notice that it's getting deeper, right? It's getting deeper. I'm not just giving the surface stuff. I'm giving you something that you might not know when I just say, hey, how's it going? You might have to know me for a little bit. And then once you see that, you're going to find, okay, Gary values his kids. So we're getting deeper. Just like Paul goes deeper with Timothy, we're getting deeper into the core. And hey, who are you? Hey, I'm Gary. And I live in, I grew up in Rock Valley. And I value my, my kids a lot. That's great. Okay. But I really want to get to your core. I want to get to your core. I want to get to your core. And you're not letting me through. And you're only giving me these surface answers until finally, okay, you got to give a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> until finally you get to your core. And I want you to say, can you go grab the microphone? Because she's not going to talk very loud. I want you to say, I'm Gary. And I'm scared, and I'm fragile, and I'm a broken human being. Can you remember all of that? So I am working to go through all of these layers. I'm Jesus Christ working to get to your core. And yep, you can tell me everything's fine. That's great. Yep, you can tell me where you live. That's great. Yep, you can tell me what you do. Yep, you can tell me what you value. I'm Jesus Christ and I want to get to your core. I want to break through all that junk. I want to break through you saying, yep, I'm fine. Everything's good. I want to break through you saying, oh, don't worry about it. I'm okay. I want to break through all of that and I want to hear you say, who are you? And I'm broken. And I'm broken. And I'm a fragile human being. And I'm a fragile human being. And then I want you to see something. I want you to know something. We have this fear, right? Whether you have admitted this or not, we have this fear. As me, Jesus, goes through these layers, what I want Jesus to say to me as a pastor is, I love you. Yeah, that's great. Because we can define ourselves by that, what we do, right? We can define ourselves by that surface stuff. And we want Jesus to accept us in that surface stuff. But we hide that. We hide that authentic core. We block that authentic core. Because I believe that in our human nature, we have this mistaken belief that if he really sees that, then he's not going to love me. I have that fear deep inside that if he really sees who I am, if he really sees me as that fragile, broken human being, then he's not going to love me. He's not going to accept me. But here's the reality of what Paul is telling us. Here's the reality that I can give you this morning. I love you. Who are you? You're Gary, and you're defined by yourself. That's fine. I love you. Who are you? You're Gary. That's where you're from. I love you. Who are you? Gary, you value your kids. Okay, I love you. Let me get to your authentic core. Who are you? You're Gary? You're broken? You're fragile? I love you. Through all of that stuff, I still love you. Through all of the brokenness, through all of the fragileness, I love your core. You have nothing that you can hide from Jesus Christ that he won't love. You have nothing hidden in your core that he won't say, I still love you. Through all of that stuff that you try to define yourself with, get to the authentic core this morning and understand that Jesus is in love with imperfect people. Jesus is in love with sinners who stand in need of a Savior. Jesus is in love with you. Jesus is in love with you. Thanks, guys. You can all sit down now. In 1 Timothy again, Paul writes that as Jesus walks through that junk, as Jesus walks through the layers of how much I give 
to other people, of what kind of levels of authenticity I, I give of myself away. Jesus Christ walks through that, gets to your core, and says, I show mercy. Christ Jesus would display his immense patience his patience to walk through all those levels, to finally get to your core and to say, I still love you. Christ Jesus showed this so that for those who would believe, receive eternal life. Just as Dylan did before, he professed that Jesus Christ loves the core him. He professed that Jesus Christ is his Savior, and so that got us through all of those things, and Dylan accepted that at my core, Jesus is in love with me. Now, you might think that this would be like a self-help kind of thing, right? You might think that, okay, this sermon, this idea of Jesus loving my core would be at the self-help section. If I go to Barnes & Nobles and I look for this idea, then I'm going to find it in the self-help section. And I'm going to think about how this does something for me. And how this can create this idea of, you know what? I kind of don't care what everybody else says because I know that Jesus loves my core. But it doesn't end there. That's not what the purpose is. That's not why Jesus walks through those levels. That's not why we let him walk through those levels. We only let him walk through those levels so that he may be given glory. After Paul is authentic to Timothy, after Paul tells him, hey, this is the stuff that Jesus still loves me through. He ends with verse 17 of this section. Now, on to the king eternal. The immortal, invisible, only God. May he have glory and honor forever and ever. This is not about me. This is not about me being accepted. This is not about you being accepted. This is about him receiving glory and honor. Because when I get through all of that, I get to my core and I find that I am a child made in the image of God. And my reflection shows his glory and his honor. We are authentic with ourselves. We are authentic with our God. We are authentic with each other so that we may give honor and glory to the King Eternal, to the immortal, immortal invisible, only God. To him be the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.